Got it. Okay, right. Thanks very much, Angus. Uh, good evening, everybody. This uh, tonight's lecture is the first of uh, first of a hat trick of lectures, one week after another. So we've got another lecture next week and the week after. But for tonight's lecture, we have Dr. Florian Fisais from the University of Edinburgh, a colleague of mine who's going to be talking about X-rays and photons and tectonics. And um, Florian, Florian and I go way back. I think, Florian, you actually started in the same year that I did. So we've been in the geosciences for, for the same amount of time. And though our research areas do not cross over really whatsoever, they do have uh, the theme of X-rays in, in common. And that's, that's about it. And we've discussed many, many great things regarding uncertainty and X-ray analysis and such and such. Um, but Florian, all, all of his current work that we're going to show comes from a, a very rich, rich sort of pedigree of experience from, uh, well, even before he did his PhD, but Florian did his PhD in the University of Berlin. And after that, he moved to the University of Western Australia for, for was it was a couple of postdocs, or was it just the one? Yeah. Two postdocs. And then following that, he moved to University of Bochum. And following that, that was another postdoc, or was that a lectureship? That was a, oh, that was a junior professorship. Yeah. Uh, following that, he moved in 2013 here to the University of Edinburgh as a lecturer. And then he's since been promoted, rightly so, to senior lecturer. But um, what, what I love about Florian is that not just his research is you know, very captivating, very enthusiastic and interested, obviously, in his own research, but he also is, you know, with regards to his teaching as well. You know, in the field, he's a fantastic field geologist, fantastic teacher in the field, but he also, you know, he also puts a lot of work and effort and thought and consideration into the pedagogical side of teaching geology. And he's been instrumental, well, he actually, he led the development of the university's new earth sciences degree. And uh, when we are allowed back into the Grant Institute and on the way down to, to the Hutton Lecture Theatre, I, I urge you all to stop halfway down the corridor and look at a poster about, uh, you know, teaching the geological sciences that, that Florian produced. So Florian is a fantastic all-around researcher, teacher and geologist and this evening we are delighted to have him here to tell us and speak to us about some of the research that he's doing involving x-rays, protons or neutrons? It's neutrons isn't it? Uh, well x-rays and neutrons yeah. It's neutron density right and, um, mm -hmm. and um, how that can be applied to researching tectonics. So without further ado I'll hand over to Florian. Thank you. Well, thanks, Tom. That was one of the most, uh, you know, the kindest introductions I've ever received, I have to say. Uh, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, I, I have to live up to what Tom sort of, the, you know, sort of sketched a bar that I have to now meet, which I'm going to give my best, uh, hopefully in a reasonably entertaining way, uh, given the uh, sort of advanced hour of the afternoon. Um, early evening. I'm going to talk about exactly what the title says. Uh, in effect, as I was telling uh, uh, my dear colleague Ian Butler uh, this afternoon about this presentation, he said, but surely you're going to talk about curling stones. And uh, I regret it that I, I'm not going to talk about curling stones. You have to invite me again, and then I'm going to tell you everything about curling stones and their collisions, given the uh, success of Bruce Moore at, uh, uh, in Beijing today. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm also not exclusively presenting my work, but I'm uh, um, the work of two of my uh, collaborators or co-workers here. Uh, Sina Marti was a postdoc with me, uh, sponsored by the uh, Swiss uh, National Science Foundation, uh, and Barry Schwichtenberg is one of my former PhD students. And at the end of the day, the efforts uh, are actually those of an entire group of people, uh, too long almost to name here. Why do I start with Mary Thorpe's uh, map? Um, actually, as I was sort of thinking of how I could introduce this topic that I'm gonna talk about to you and hopefully also convey my excitement about this, um, I thought actually what, what, what we are doing is we are we're slightly changing the way we look at things. We look at established or sort of 
procedures and experiments and facts even in a new way. And, and that is exactly what Mary Thorpe also did when she, uh, when she analyzed these bathymetric maps, which simply didn't exist before. So really the identification of mid-oceanic ridges hinged on a technological advance. And very often in science anyway, but surely also in geoscience uh, uh, sort of steps forward, they are actually, they involve a technological advance. And this is what I will be talking about mostly today. And I will hopefully making a, be making a case for, you know, for the method uh, and, and some of the results. Uh, this is not my work. I'm, I'm actually scrupulously, I've, I've actually, since I started my postdoctoral work, the only achievement I ever did was really realize the potential and, and then riding the wave. And, and so as such, uh, I was an early adopter. Um, tectonics are still moving. I'm a structural geologist, so my primary interest is fluid rock interaction and tectonics. Well, there's two interests. Uh, uh, in, in tectonics, something that is a really vibrant field and that, that, is, uh, that has evolved massively over the last 15 years is our understanding of subduction zones. And in particular, uh, <clears throat> The, 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 the way how subduction zones work from essentially the trench all the way down to intermediate depth earthquakes, 200, 300 kilometers. And, uh, and we have found out uh, an awful lot through thanks to um, seismic data and geodesy about how uh, subduction zones actually move beyond the earthquake cycle, right? So it's not just plate movements they're obviously not just accommodated in earthquakes and and this whole uh, family of uh, slow slip and tremor uh, that has been added to uh, to to our understanding of uh, subduction zones is, is, is super exciting because we now know that uh, subduction zones dissipate almost half of the energy that goes into them in these events now this is a whole family of of, of processes that happen as subduction zones. How do we investigate these? And this is now getting me to my topic. Classically in geosciences, uh, especially in tectonics, I might say uh, we have two tools, two families of tools. We can go to the field. We can do very thorough field work. It's one of my passions uh, on small areas. Uh, and we can try to understand fossilized uh, tectonic scenarios, such as this is in Sifnos here. Uh, where uh, Wittner Baer is a professor in Zurich. She, she analyzed essentially exhumed, uh, um, exhumed um, uh, subduction channel material and, and tried to infer the processes that are behind slow slips and tremors, okay? Uh, which have been hinted at from geophysical data really. Um, the other thing is, the, the problem with that is really that this is a bad, that there's no time resolution in this, right? So if we want to understand the process, process implies that we have some control over the time axis. And, and, and really here, that's not really given. It's, we can use space as a proxy for time, by, uh, but ultimately we have no, no handle on time. Right? Uh, and even when we interpret excellent outcrops such as this one here, this is a paper by Oliver Plümper, uh, in uh, Norway or from Norway uh, field sites where they sort of try to is understand how uh, serpentinite dehydration operates from the micro to the macro scale. This is also a process which is considered responsible for a lot of seismicity in subduction zones. Ultimately, you know, what they say is fluid escape here. I, I, I don't see a fluid escaping, right? So there's, again, there's a snapshot in time, which relies on us believing that we can actually, we got the time element right. The opposite way is to do experiments. And I've obviously copied here, I've, you know, this is uh, Paul Young in, in Toronto, uh, Geoengineering Institute. And, uh, and this is one of the most badass deformation apparatus you can find on the internet, right? It's clearly, it's really seriously big. And, he can do fantastic things with that, but we can't see inside, right? I mean, in fact, Paul Young can see inside to some extent because he can, uh, this is a device which is specialized in recording acoustic emissions to a very high level of detail, uh, but still he can see what's going on, right? He can deform rocks, he can dehydrate maybe. Uh, so, but this is essentially, these things are black boxes. 
and they can measure, of course, uh, uh, stress and strain uh, in these and sort of infer what has happened. And this is what uh, Jenna and Hurst did here for uh, dehydration and brittlement, which is a key process for this cast as a key process in subduction zone where serpentinites dehydrate from olivine and, and that fluid overpressures the rock and essentially hydrofracks its way out and then generates seismicity. So this is what they recovered Jenak and Hearst recovered from one of the many, many experiments and interpreted again, right? So there's no direct control on, uh, on the process itself, no direct observational possibilities. And this is what we are overcoming. Uh, uh, and slowly, step by step, but we're getting there, right? And the tool that we use is uh, uh, X-ray microtomography. So X-ray microtomography, we essentially use light sources, which are orders, and that is many orders, of magnitude brighter than the sun to look through our specimens. Um, some of you may have been unfortunate enough to experience that in a hopefully dosed down uh, version uh, when you had a CT scan at the hospital. Uh, essentially, we do the same thing, except we rotate our patient that is the sample and we keep the light source and the camera system on the other side of the patient uh, uh, static and that's for obvious reasons, because we do most of our work at synchrotron light sources, and these are particle accelerators. So they are. This is the uh, the the probably most exciting development that is currently, or the most exciting particle accelerator that is currently being built. Uh, that is the high energy photon source in the north of Beijing. It's supposed to become operational in 2025, and I hope to be one of the first users, uh, at least from the Earth Sciences side. Uh, so these are particle accelerators. The particles that are being accelerated are electrons. And to keep electrons in a quasi-circular path, we use magnets. And whenever we uh, force an electron by a magnet to uh, change its course, electromagnetic radiation is being emitted. This is the light that we use, which we can filter. Uh, we can select a specific wavelength or uh, energy or uh, energy bandwidth as we like it. Uh, and we can direct that at our sample, uh, where some of it is being uh, absorbed. Uh, we can collect the remaining bits here on a scintillator, which transforms the X-rays into visible light, and that we can capture in the camera. That sounds uh, sounds a bit uh, uh, complicated, which is why I've illustrated. I want to illustrate that with the chicken. Uh, here, uh, this is uh, the principles of X-ray tomography are really simple. Actually, we make X-rays particle accelerator or an x-ray tube as we have it downstairs we direct them onto a sample uh, some x-rays get absorbed as we know from you know having radiographs of broken bones done and so forth uh, we collect those that make it to the other side in the radiograph we rotate the sample by a small amount and repeat steps two to four and that relates to that frozen chicken here which a genius guy on youtube scanned in his garage with a self-made uh, CT scanner. We give all of these radiographs to computer and let it do the math, essentially reconstruct the three-dimensional model of our chicken. Uh, that's all there is to X-ray tomography, except we don't use a, a small uh, X-ray uh, uh, tubes, but we use a part accelerator to make our X-rays. So I'm gonna move on here. Okay, here we go. So what is really to be gained? Uh, I want to illustrate that through that table here and also show you what the data can do on the left hand side. Let's look at this data on the left hand side first because that's more exciting. Uh, so what you see here is a, a virtual section through a gypsum cylinder, tiny gypsum cylinder, uh, which is, at, as we look at it, it's pressurized, uh, it's differentially loaded, so stressed, and it's heated to 115 degrees Celsius and gypsum at those temperatures, gypsum is a calcium sulfate with a lot of water in the lattice. At these temperatures, it starts to kick out the water and transform itself into a metastable phase called hemihydrate uh, or bessonite if it's naturally occurring. Uh, if we keep heating, we produce anhydrite in the end. But hemihydrate is the stuff you may know as plaster of Paris uh, that's being used in, in home renovation DIY projects, right? So what you see here is essentially minerals being conceived, uh, hemihydrate grains being conceived and then growing. And you see a lot of porosity 
uh, which is the dark phases, right? So the gray values here correspond to the X-ray absorption, the, the, the amount of X-rays that actually are being absorbed. There's some complicated mathematics behind that. We don't need to go there. But important is that we can actually see and quantify the metamorphic reactions that we're looking at in this particular case, right? So coming back to this table on the right-hand side here, which is comparing classical approaches, black box experiments, and sort of the field-based studies with what we do, uh, where in classical black box experiments, and I'm not like, I don't want to, you know, uh, criticize these at all. The, you know, I have the, the highest respect for these people doing that. But at the end of the day, they are limited to indirect observations on a macro scale. Bulk strain evolution, how does the sample perform as a whole? How does the load uh, evolve that I have to apply to deform the sample? What can I hear? Uh, and maybe how, how does the permeability, how can I pump fluid through my sample? That is thing that, things that can be, that's macro scale. So, but behind that are processes such as the one that we, uh, that we look at on the left-hand side. And so we need to, ultimately, we need to understand uh, the grain scale in order to understand the macro scale. And this is where we can help here. We can, as you can see here, trace each individual grain, each individual pore, any process, in space and time on the micro scale, and then inform essentially our macro scale, the interpretation of our macro scale data. Okay, so in order to do this and study crustal processes, uh, you need, there's a contribution we have to make, right? We can go to synchrotron, there's one in, in Oxfordshire, uh, the diamond light source, uh, which we regularly go to. Uh, the week after next, I'll be traveling to Switzerland to the Swiss light source. Uh, and in order to study geological processes uh, and tectonic processes, we need to recreate the conditions that these processes happen at, right? Some of them are just, just require heat. Others require, of course, confining pressure uh, and a differential stress. So what we need is essentially uh, an experimental device. But the additional complication that we have to satisfy is that uh, it needs to be x-ray transparent. So we need to be able to see through it. Now, even though I have a synchrotron at my hand, which is super bright, that I cannot see through everything. So there is a limit to sort of the, the, the pressure vessels we can use, for example, right? So uh, our group in Edinburgh uh, has over the last 10 years or so really specialized in building these X-ray transparent devices. Now I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily bragging when I say that we are one of a handful of groups that can do that on that level. Uh, and this is our, uh, our um, most famed tools. Uh, they all have Nordic names. Um, there's a long story to that. But um, anyway, Sleipnir is Odin's six-legged horse. Uh, that's uh, uh, essentially one of our workhorses. Mjölnir is Thor's hammer. And we have different, as we are geologists, we have different hammers. We have big hammers, Storm Mjölnir here. And now the latest edition is a hot hammer, which is Hate Mjölnir. Uh, that's that's a very exciting scene. So um, I want to show you how we use these tools and what we can learn from using them. So this is a figure that I got from John Wheeler, who is a metamorphic uh, uh, geologist, metamorphic petrologist in, in uh, Liverpool. And that's, uh, he's, a, he's a great thinker, fantastic intellectual. Uh, um, and he's just, what he's tried here is essentially understand all the processes and state variables that characterize a metamorphic rock that is also deforming. Okay, that piece of rock that we subduct in our subduction zone. And you can see this is a mess, right? I mean, there's like, it's, it's a total mess in fact. It's, it's, so there's, what I wanna see when I look at that is essentially a set of corks, right? And they're all interlinked. And it means in a metamorphic, in a, in, a, in a reacting, deforming rock, you cannot turn one cork without turning a lot of others too, right? And that means they're all coupled. So in fact, uh, I look at a metamorphic deforming rock, rock as a chemically, hydraulically, mechanically, thermally coupled system, right? And I try to understand how they're all linked. Now, in order to understand an instability on the grain scale, something that will trigger an earthquake, I need to understand how they interact, how they come together, right? What, what, what development is a critical one? Which parameter can I change 
or can I not change in order to trigger an earthquake? Uh, you also note that with, I'm sure you're familiar uh, with many of these terms. Uh, doesn't matter if you're not. Uh, um, there are no scales attached. We have no feeling for you know magnitudes of any of these. And this is where we're trying to. This is what we're trying to change, really, in our group. So I wanna, I wanna, I wanna show you two studies now from Sina and Berit, uh, where we, where we do a little bit of a little bit of a contribution towards that. And the first one is actually uh, Sina's study, and Sina looked at evaporites. So evaporites, chemical sediments, uh, mostly halite, some gypsum, and then lots of other minerals which are not really probably that significant when it comes to the significance of evaporites as detachment horizons. Now, detachment horizons are essentially where major thrust uh, movements happen. And I'm showing here you, I'm showing you here uh, three cases. This is from the Swiss Jura Mountains here where you have evaporites. These are all uh, uh, Permian, uh, sometimes the Triassic uh, evaporites here where, uh, where major thrust movements localized. Okay, so this is uh, the southwestern North Alps, this is Dean, uh, and this is the Southern Pyrenees. And uh, again, here there is uh, evaporites, the Triassic evaporites here that all of that thrust movement happen on. Okay, so uh, within these detachments, traditionally, it was assumed that uh, high pore fluid pressures, and that's, a, that's essentially ideas that were formulated in the, in the late 1950s, high pore fluid pressures facilitate the movements of these thrusts. Uh, so where do the hypothalamic pressures come from? Chips and dehydration. That, that's the, the model, the standard model. Hubbard and Ruby, uh, uh, they and, and that group, they did some uh, really, uh, uh, I guess, um, landmark experiments where they showed what happens if you dehydrate chipsum, which is differentially stressed, the system goes really weak. Uh, and we wanted to have a closer look at that. So out of these forest of feedbacks and couple of processes that, uh, that I showed you just earlier, we isolated a few here. And we looked at, uh, we wanted to look at a system which had gypsum and halite in it. So salt and gypsum. And we wanted to stress it and heat it at the same time. And we wanted to see how the dehydration here on the left uh, affects the sample deformation and its deformation behavior, its response to stress. And these are some of the uh, feedbacks and, you know, uh, uh, that we sort of thought would be important. The uh, porosity formation changes permeability, which facilitates fluid migration and affects the pore fluid pressure, which in fact dehyd affects dehydration. So of course, there's also, uh, of course, the mechanical components, right? So uh, this is sort of the, the, there's no specific research question. We just wanted to explore that system at that point. So Sina, uh, spent a lot of time in our in our labs downstairs to make the perfect sample. Uh, these are these are synthetic samples. Well, the gypsum is is from Italy. That's an alabaster that we core. Uh, but we wanted to make these sandwiches and succeeded in making them. So these are sandwiches. They are um, just under three millimeters in diameter and about a centimeter high. And obviously with the gypsum layer in the center and two halite layers on either side. Now the halite is considered impermeable. That, that's actually something that's utilized in a fair number of applications. Hydrogen storage uh, considers the halide to be uh, impermeable. Uh, nuclear waste storage also banks on that and so forth. Uh, well, it has a very low permeability. Um, then we install this sample in, in our Mjolnir rig uh, here. That sample sits in the center. This rig here sits on the CT scanner at the Swiss light source. This is a rotation table. Um, so lots of connections there. Uh, we pressurize the sample here to eight megapascal, so the profile pressure is 15 MPa here, and then we, we differentially loaded it. And then uh, we did a couple of these experiments, of course, at different temperatures. So what did we see? Now these are, I'm gonna talk you through these figures. They are not straightforward, but uh, uh, not that complicated either. So these are vertical sections through that sample. Okay, so they're, they're uh, vertical sections, they're essentially virtual, data, so they are taken from the tomographs, and which is a 3D data set, and we cut through that and slide through that virtually on a computer, and we look at our sample here. So the gypsum layer sits in the middle, that's 
unreacted at this point, and these uh, these slightly porous layers, which are non-permeable, but there there's a, a little bit of residual porosity in there, which we couldn't get rid of, uh, sit on either side, and they are sort of insulating or isolating the uh, uh, the gypsum layer in the middle. Now, if we zoom in and we see this interface, and that will become important in a second. Uh, you can see there's not much going on. The sample is at 99 degrees here, uh, Celsius here, uh, still during uh, during heating. We heat it up to 108. Uh, and you zoom in even further here, and you can nicely see this interface. This is a half a millimeter. Now, uh, as we reached 108 degrees, and that was only a few minutes later, uh, you can see the reaction starting to happen here, right? So we expect this gypsum to dehydrate, just as I showed you earlier. Uh, now the, you can see the quality of this data is slightly less good, but it has to do with the experimental setup and the beam line and so forth. But we can very nicely see still there's this halide uh, needles growing and there's porosity between. And interestingly now, there's also uh, porosity at the interface here with the halide, which wasn't there before. It's the same scale here. If we wait a little longer and follow that reaction, it only this is really a matter of minutes at these temperatures, then we can see there's a lot happening in the sample. And we're now resolving those grain scale processes that I pointed out late, uh, earlier. Uh, we see that there's a reaction front developing here, which is slowly migrating downwards and also upwards from the bottom. We see there's obviously fractures uh, emerging, micro fractures here. They will be fluid filled at that state. Uh, and there's now needles appearing here. And interestingly, if we look here, 12 minutes, then in comparison to earlier, and I'm going to show you that again on the next slide, uh, the halide now also looks different. Maybe let's go back just to see. This is what we started with. Uh, and this is what it looked uh, like 15 minutes later, so 12 minutes later. Uh, clearly, something has happened here. And also, this layer at the interface is gone. So. Um, that's interesting. This is rendered in 3D now. We extracted a volume, a small subvolume of this, uh, pretty much what I just showed you, and, and just selected the, uh, isolated the porosity and quantified it. And the fact that this sort of pore cluster here has all the same color means that it's interconnected. So this is porosity which can freely communicate. Uh, at that point, there's relatively little. That's now a different experiment. That's why this is SHP19, which we ran at a slightly lower temperature, which is why it took a bit longer, uh, gave us better resolution. Uh, here we still have these isolated pores in the halide, uh, growing porosity here. And then there's this moment when suddenly porosity really increases. And you can see that down here in these curves, where the, uh, the green curve is actually showing porosity increase. And the black curve is more important here. That is how much of the total porosity in that layer is accommodated by the largest interconnected pore, right? Which is essentially here, that one, that one. But then here, we have through going porosity all the way, right? And uh, that was quite exciting for us. We did interpret that as hydrofracturing. So I think what I think we documented is the first time ever in 4D, whatever that means, and this earth, that somebody uh, imaged hydrofracking actually as it happened. Uh, and interestingly, we had sort of expected the, or we had sort of considered the possibility of a hydrofracture to form, but we weren't sure what it would look like. And what we saw here was this, the whole thing is hydrofracked uh, homogeneously, pervasively, right? So the fluid just escaped. Remember, I pointed out that layer of porosity at the interface, that was the stage when prior to hydrofracking, when the pore fluid pressure built up there, this, this scenario here, and with a very high pore fluid pressure. And then suddenly it fracted, the fluid fracked its way out of the system and it just drained, right? And if you want to extrapolate that uh, to geological conditions, then you could probably argue that impermeable salt layers are not that impermeable after all. Uh, and maybe that at least uh, at the conditions that we had realized in this particular experiment, which correspond to 600 meters to maybe a kilometer down, halide is not such a good sealant as you would expect. Okay. Now, that's the only equation I'm going to show you. Uh, don't worry. Uh, and I'm going to talk you through it. Um, I want to move on to another really interesting set of experiments, a uh, study that actually was just published uh, late last week, early this week in Solid Earth uh, by Berit uh, Schwichtenberg. Uh, Berit looked also at halite, but she was interested in uh, something else. She was interested in 
uh, dissolution precipitation creep. Now, what's that? Um, if we talk about a thrust movement, the emplacement of a tectonic nap in a thin skin tectonic environment, such as the ones that I showed you, the South Pyrenean forelands or, or Dean or, or the Jura Mountains, uh, these happen on, you know, the glide horizons are, are these evaporites. And, and most, of the, 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 most of the graph there is being done by halite deforming, so the rock salt. At these conditions, so if, if any material has to, to deform, what it's doing is it's doing work, right? And I always tell my students, imagine like, you know, a rock has a toolbox and given, depending on the boundary conditions, depending on where it is and what the temperatures are and the pressure and the, the water fugacity and so forth, it chooses the tool that does the job best. Anybody who's doing DIY, like myself, passionate, uh, always knows it's important to have the right tool for a job. Right, so the same is true for rocks and dissolution precipitation creep is the tool that halite chooses when it deforms in, in these evaporitic detachments. Now, what's that? Uh, it's pretty simple, actually. The, the theory is so that if you have uh, two grains here touching in a point contact, uh, you locally increase, of course, the, you have a, a very high contact stress here, and that feeds back on the solubility of the salt. So locally, you can, uh, because solubility is also a function of, of pressure, if there's a fluid film sitting on that interface, the solubility will locally rise due to that contact stress. Uh, more material will, will be uh, dissolved right here. A concentration gradient will emerge and uh, material will start to diffuse away from here and it will sort of re-precipitate at the earliest opportunity. That, that's the theory, right? Essentially, you dissolve uh, salt here, quartz, any, anything, calcite does the same. Uh, and you, you, you carry it because it diffuses around the corner and it re-precipitates from the fluid. That's dissolution precipitation creep. And overall, what you achieve is a shortening of the sample. Uh, in theory, uh, so this is a constitutive equation which looks complicated, but it says, Essentially, that's the rate at which that, uh, that shortening happens, the strain rate, and there's a whole lot of parameters which you don't need to worry about. There's temperature showing up in there, there's a, a, a stress of an exponent, and the grain size, that's an important one. So the stress is over here, this is the exponential term, the stress and the grain size. So it's inverse, in, uh, it's inverse uh, correlated to the power of three uh, to the grain size. Grain size is really important. And that sort of emphasizes and that's the takeaway from that, 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 that component where the process is affected by uh, that process of dissolution, but then transport around the corner, which is controlled by the grain size and re-precipitation. Okay, so transport distances are assumed not to exceed the grain size. Okay, and dissolution sites are locally connected to precipitation sites. The other thing that's important is uh, very often, um, Many of you will have seen that if you looked at the stylolite in the field. A stylolite is essentially localized pressure solution. And stylolites are these sort of wiggly uh, patterns you often see in limestones. Actually, most of the what's interpreted as bedding planes in the basal quartzite are actually stylolites up in up in a suit. Uh, and if we could go up there together, I could show you beautiful stylolites where that becomes totally clear, right? Now you see stylolites because they're decorated with reddish residue, stuff that hasn't been dissolved and moved away. And often these are sheet silicates, micas or chloride, uh, and, uh, and sometimes clays, clay minerals. Uh, and uh, sheet silicates are generally believed to accelerate the process, leading to strain localization. So essentially the, the task at the onset of Barrett's uh, thesis, or PhD thesis was, Let's make a stylolite in the lab and watch it. And the reason we wanted to make that is because we were really interested in the porosity evolution in the process. So Barrett also set up her own experiments and these are now offline, meaning they are not done on a CT scanner, but they are scanned. So it's what she does essentially. She also designed her own samples here. Uh, pretty cool there. These are little pedometric cells which are made from a, a high performance polymer that we use a lot of peak. Uh, the samples here, five millimeter diameter. Uh, this is halite. Then there's mica in, in, in specific configurations. That's a biotype. 
uh, and then there is some uh, salt uh, glass beads, pardon me, uh, just to maintain uh, permeability into the sample. <clears throat> and these are then loaded into this, uh, this rig here. And the rig is, uh, these are straining frames, we call these, so essentially they, they cannot move anywhere. And this is a pneumatic uh, ram, if you want, an actuator. So the, the, the screwed into the top plate here, and, if we, and that's connected to a pneumatic system. So we, we pressurize that, and then a stamp comes out and presses down onto these things from above, as you can see here. There's a system to control the flow, pore fluid. Every now and then, Barrett took all of these things out, carried them to the other building uh, behind me, and scanned them in our CT scanner. And this is where these. And she got a time series essentially by doing that repeatedly. So this is what she saw. Again, these are vertical sections through our reconstructed three-dimensional data sets. Each of these is a three-dimensional data set in reality. Uh, believe me, it's easier to show you that than to show the thing in 3D. You, you wouldn't see it anywhere near as much. What you can see here is the glass beads. You can see the halite. So this is the rock salt. You can see the biotype flakes in there. Uh, and there's different configurations. There's a sample which only has a biotype layer in the middle, which, which is I was, you know, I was, I was betting that there would be a star light forming there. It didn't. Uh, uh, there is another uh, sample which only had biota in the upper half here, and this is, of course, a control sample which is just pure salt. It doesn't have anything else to the salt. Now these are the compaction curves. So what these are essentially, we measured, we we measured how the samples shortened as a function of time and. Barrett was incredibly patient. These are probably the longest run halide compaction experiments that have ever been published. Uh, they ran for a month. Uh, and that was actually quite interesting, uh, an interesting aspect. You can see over time, these samples get shorter. The distance between the glass bits here gets uh, smaller. You can actually track individual biotite grains in there and can see how they, how they are sort of uh, compact. I'm gonna show you more of that in a second. And the other interesting bit is, the darkest phase in there, the dark gray, that's brine field porosity. That porosity disappears, most obviously so, in this specimen here. And there's no more porosity left in the end. Uh, now, remember, we were thinking about stylolites, and we were actually, we wanted to study pressure solution and how it leads, how the, the sheet silicates essentially initiate strain localization into the formation of these distinct stylolite planes. And we wanted to see how does the porosity work around that, how is it evolved. Uh, so here, to, much to our surprise, we found that, well, in order to, if you wanted to localize the formation of this bulk shortening in here, so this means any localization would have would have would, would essentially mean that this biotite bearing layer would have to take up more of the shortening point. Otherwise, there's no localization. It would have to compact more. This is actually shown here. Well, the fact that this did not happen is shown here in this. So this is just a shortening of the biotite layer plotted against the entire sample. And the hypothesis was if there is strain localization, the biotat layer must compact more than the rest in percent. Right? And didn't. Uh, compaction does not, compaction is uniformly distributed throughout the sample. That was question number one, or like surprise number one, I would say, because from the sheet silicates, we did expect that to happen. That has been published that sheet silicates accelerate strain localization. It doesn't happen. Uh, and also the other sample here the same thing. So there's a, there's a little bit of mechanical rearrangement early on, but later on when it really counts, when we reach this sort of what we call the steady state compaction, uh, there is no difference in the compaction. But that has no effect anymore. Also, uh, and that was very interesting. These are sort of, uh, these are just now looking at the, at the biotides. We isolated the biotides and we followed them uh, through time. And essentially what, what interested us, we thought, well, Essentially, what we have here is a lot of a lot of halide grains, and they sort of point load the biotides. So we did expect the biotides to sort of essentially rearrange themselves all into, as you would expect for a proper foliation, as essentially all becoming parallel. Now, these diagrams here, they sort of you may recognize these are essentially a, a, a stereo plot. Uh, they show uh, the, the perpendicular to the basal planes, the eigenvector, which is perpendicular to the basal plane of biotite. So essentially that rotates. And in fact, 
what we were also quite surprised to find, it doesn't react, uh, it doesn't rotate very significantly. There's no major rearrangement of the parietides in there. Uh, it doesn't happen. And that essentially was actually highlighting that the dissolution process at the interface with the parietides was so effective that the halide never managed to point load. The, 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 the analog that we used when we discussed this was essentially think of a hot stove and take an ice cube and try to exert pressure onto the stove. The ice will melt as you as you as you as, as it interfaces with the stove, right? So you'll never really be. This is it looked pretty much the same. So quite quite interesting insights. Uh, the other thing here is that um, what we did observe was that the porosity, and I hinted at that earlier, decreased quite significantly in the biotite bearing layers. So. That, that was obvious. So what we see here is essentially that's the control sample where the porosity uh, decreased uniformly as a function of compaction. That yeah, no surprise there. Here we have uh, that uh, that sample which has uh, halide biotype halide. Uh, the, that's the entire bio sample uh, porosity reduction top layer bottom layer. Well, and then you can see quite clearly see here the porosity in the in the central biotype bearing layer is decreasing more. Uh, now. Some of you may actually already have realized that this created a paradox, right? What we do see is that uh, the sample doesn't compact preferentially in these biotype bearing layers, but the porosity decreases preferentially there. And what we thought would decrease the porosity was actually compaction, like essentially uh, mechanical compaction. And that didn't happen, right? It, it absolutely didn't happen. Um, so, if the pores are not collapsing, they must be filled. That's the other way how you can reduce porosity. And that's what happens. The salt content increases in these layers. And the salt content here is shown in blue. These are for two samples. This was an incredibly difficult analysis to do. I just want to give extra credits here to Barrett because that getting that graph well, took us weeks. Uh, but what she could show essentially that we have we have biotite in the central layer as a, as a sort of a reference. The biotite content didn't change, but relative to the biotite content, the salt content increased. And that was true for both of our biotite bearing examples. Now, that is actually uh, a totally under, uh, underappreciated finding, I would say. And I have to work a bit harder to get my colleagues to acknowledge the significance of that. Because what we think this proves is that the theory is wrong. You know, remember, I made quite a big point at the beginning to say that the, the, the dissolved soul just moves around the corner and gets reprecipitated. What we have identified is obviously material transport, salt transport on, on, on distances which are significantly greater than individual grains by a factor of 50 or so. So salt is obviously, there is, there's another driver, another pool for the salt. And uh, uh, in order to interpret our data, obviously we, we did our homework uh, and we came across a really interesting paper by, this is a group um, from uh, uh, south of Chicago somewhere. Uh, um, they must all be retired now, but uh, they wrote a couple of really visionary papers in the, in, the, in the early 80s. And they postulated that there is a texture-based feedback emerging. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, imagine that sample that I showed you, uh, the porosity will not be perfectly distributed, perfectly homogeneously distributed across that sample. It does fluctuate slightly, and it fluctuates slightly more where the biotite is, right? Biotite, different morphology, slightly different surface chemistry, or massively different surface chemistry, in fact. Uh, so there's a different porosity at the onset of the experiment in the biotite bearing layer than there is in the salt layer. Now, the sample is uniaxially loaded, uh, so there's an externally imposed stress bulk stress on the sample, which is distributed over the grain contacts. If the porosity is locally higher, then you have higher stresses on the, the lesser, the smaller, correspondingly smaller uh, contact areas you have, and slightly uh, lesser stresses on the biotype in the biotype bearing domain, right? And that gives rise to a concentration gradient. Uh, which we think is being exploited here. That, that hasn't been observed before. So essentially where the classical theory predicts that salt is just being transported during the solution precipitation creep around the corner, as I said, there is also a potential for salt to be transported on much larger distances here. And that, that is sort of 
uh, destroying or clogging up, as you want, the uh, porosity in that central layer. So now I want to pretty much just in time, actually, uh, come back to uh, where I started. Uh, and so I think, you know, we're getting there. I, I, you know, I like starting with Mary Thorpe didn't mean that, you know, I put our work anywhere near the significance of that, but we're making small steps in the right direction, I think. And we are getting closer to understanding the complexity of coupled chemical, mechanical, hydraulic processes in rocks. And uh, the experimental capabilities that we have developed in our group in Edinburgh, uh, they really already allow us to sort of study processes as we would see them here in the uppermost kilometers. Now, I want to conclude with an outlook uh, on, sorry, that's, uh, uh, that should be here with this slide. I want to conclude with an outlook on, on, on this rig here. This is Hake Murley, the hot hammer. And this will now allow us to go into that domain. So hate Melnia is, is literally being, the last tests are running, not as we speak, unfortunately my postdoc is not working that long, uh, but he has been busy the last couple of days, uh, days just uh, finessing off the last little uh, uh, um, bumps and they're all gone, we are ready to go. Uh, and this is a rig that is an internally heated triaxial deformation apparatus, a complete new design, actually uh, Edinburgh exclusive, I would say. Um, and I'm really proud of this. We, we, have, we have managed actually, so this is the difficulties. I have two minutes, I wanna talk about difficulties in this actually. The trick is we need to pressurize this much higher. We wanna, and we're not quite there yet. We, 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 get, we can get to 30 MPa at the moment, maybe 50, uh, but at the same time, uh, we wanna heat to uh, 350 degrees Celsius, okay? So the challenge here is in order to do that, you need a big fat pressure vessel. Well, that's something we cannot afford because we need to see through the pressure vessel. So we need to keep our pressure vessel as thin as possible while keeping it as strong as possible. And the way to achieve that is by, by, uh, by um, really putting an emphasis on the temperature management inside the cell. So while the temperature is actually 350 throughout the sample and the thermal gradient is less than five degrees, over two centimeters, which is a fantastic figure. The temperature here on the inside of the pressure vessel is never more than 100 degrees Celsius. And at those temperatures, we can get away with a relatively thin aluminum alloy pressure vessel. It's a 7,000 series, pretty fancy alloy. Uh, but that is thin enough so that we can comfortably see through. But the strength of that aluminum drops off at 150 degrees Celsius. We always have to keep below that. So that, that is really, and uh, the temperature management in here happens through a, a really complex uh, set of heat guides uh, and thermal baffling. And, and that took us pretty much the entire pandemic to develop. Um, yeah, but with that and the success of that rig is already also in work and that will get us over 400 degrees and up to a kilobar confining pressure. So then we can really go into that domain. Uh, I hope that these will, you know, like deliver many, many more uh, exciting studies, such as the one that I had the pleasure to introduce you tonight. And with that, I wanna, I think there's not much more coming here. Uh, thank you for today. <laughs>